Hey guys, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Mike. You guys are rocking with me and Mike is Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we are diving into a new series. This is Winter War 1939-1940 uh, by Kings and Generals. And without further ado, just like always, we're just going to dive right into it. Let's go. Although World War II is often depicted as a conflict between two major alliances, it can be divided into many smaller wars, as the states not willing to join a side were often forced to fight on their own. A variety of factors led to a conflict between Finland and the Soviet Union in 1939-1940, the conflict we now know as the Winter War. In this video, we will describe the origins and opening moves of this conflict. If you're interested in the history of this era, don't forget to check out our second channel, The Cold War. The link is in the top right corner. <clears throat> yeah, there's definitely a whole bunch of different uh, smaller battles that don't really get covered of, you know, just pretty much of Soviet Union trying to regain that lost you know, Russian Empire territory that they that was pretty much lost whenever all these different states within it, you know, just decided to separate itself whenever it collapsed the way it did. And obviously Finland got what it got. Um, I think the Ukraine, uh, obviously, pretty much the whole uh, Western Bloc and some uh, states down or countries down in, um, in the uh, Caucasus, I think, broke off. But then the Soviets uh, regained a, pretty much a pretty good t chunk of that back. And the only stuff that they really lost was Poland and Finland, essentially, for the most part. But yeah, let's keep going though. The relationship between Russia and Finland was always tumultuous due to a variety of geographical, political and economic factors. Finland was a constant field of battle between Sweden and Russian entities. The Treaty of Nurtaboy of 1323, signed by Sweden and the Novgorod Republic, divided Karelia, the region populated by the Balto-Finnic Karelians. As Sweden became more powerful over the next few centuries, it took over the rest of Finland and forced the Tsardom of Russia to cede more of South Karelia in 1617. However, fortunes would turn and by the end of the Great Northern War and the Russo-Swedish War in the first half of the 18th century, Sweden had given Karelia to Russia. The two empires continued to fight, and Russia, supported by Napoleonic France, won the Finnish War in 1809. As a result, Russia annexed Finland, which became the autonomous Grand Duchy of Finland, with its own laws and administration, and the Russian Emperor as its duke. Previously, a yeah, freaking Russia was going all over the place, you know what I'm saying? Because uh, if I'm not mistaken, around this, well, not around this time, I, I think only a few decades later from this time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they would start trying to, you know, work their way towards Constantinople or um, Istanbul or whatever you, want, you know, whatever you want to call it. And they started trying to work their way down there because, um, but obviously uh, Britain and France and uh, the Empire stop them so that they wouldn't have control of the black sea and as well as everything else so but yeah it's just kind of crazy how pretty expansionist they were back in these days but yeah let's keep going she of finland with its own laws and administration and the russian emperor as its duke previously a swedish general gustav moritz Armfeldt, had become an influential counselor for the emperor alexander the first and his influence was crucial in reuniting south karelia with the duchy the early period of liberal Russian rule in Finland gave way to a more autocratic approach over the second half of the 19th century, as Russian emperors made deliberate attempts to Russify the duchy. However, these methods only strengthened the national identity of the Finns, and the Fenomen movement underlined the yearning for independence. The autocratic policies of Nicholas II led to the assassination yeah, of him. freaking Russia does that with all their, uh, you know, or used to do that with all their different um, provinces and stuff. It's just trying to, um, you know, essentially assimilate them into the into their Russian culture, into their, um, you know, society and stuff to try to nullify, you know, that that um, that fervor of, uh, of sedition and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Of trying to take break apart or, you know. Um, 
revolution, stuff like that. Nicholas II led to the assassination of his governor in Finland, which also joined the revolution of 1905 with a general strike. As a result, the autonomy of Finland was removed and the Russification intensified. In November 1914, an underground student movement started plotting to gain independence and was supported by Germany. To weaken Russia, the German Empire trained groups of Finns as Jaegers, elite light infantry. In February of 1917, Russia was rocked by a revolution. The Russian provincial government returned autonomous rights to the Finns. However, the internal situation in Finland wasn't great. Both left and right-wing parties vied for power, creating security forces known as the Red Guard and White Guard respectively. After the Bolsheviks took over the Russian government in November, all sides of the political spectrum in Finland were eager to declare independence from Russia, and they did just that on December 6th. The Bolsheviks were not strong enough to prevent this, and by the end of the year, Lenin's government recognized Finland's independence. The latter hoped that the Red Guard would make Finland communist and they would rejoin Russia down the line. With Germany and Sweden supporting the White Guard and the Bolsheviks supporting the Red Guard, Finland entered a period of civil war in January 1918. Both sides had around 100,000 troops, but the Whites had former officers of the Russian army and Jaegers fighting for them, and they were led by a talented former general of the Russian army, Karl Gustav Emil Mannerheim. This, and the fact that the Germans occupied Red-controlled Helsinki in April 1918, allowed the Whites to win the civil war in May 1918. 40,000 Finns died in this war. To appease Germany, Finland elected Prince Frederick Charles of Hesse as a king, but even before he arrived, he abdicated due to the revolution in Germany, so the Finns opted for a presidential republic. Finnish nationalists wanted to take over Karelia, and three volunteer expeditions attempted to take the region in 1918 and 1919, all of which failed. Simultaneously, Finnish volunteers participated in the Estonian Liberation War, helping the country to gain independence from the Soviets. At this point, Menaheim created a plan to occupy the capital of Russia, Petrograd, modern city. And you know, I, I think it's really cool too how during this time period, how you know during these different wars and stuff, all these different uh, countries are kind of helping each other out. Because I mean, even you know the the shitty countries are kind of helping each other out, like freaking Spain and Germany and. Uh, you know, during the 1930s and stuff, Spain, Germany, and freaking, uh, I think even Italy was helping them out in their freaking civil war out there, and then freaking, uh, obviously, they were help, uh, Finland was helping out Estonia with theirs, as Estonia was helping out, um, Latvia and Belarus and all that stuff, so, um, you know, it's just kind of cool how that was, but, yeah. In just Petersburg, help. but the government rejected the proposal. Finally, Finland and Soviet Russia signed the Treaty of Tartu in 1920, establishing new borders, with Finland gaining Petsamo and access to the Arctic Ocean, while ceding Repola and Poryayabi. In 1921, Karelia started a rebellion against the Bolsheviks and was supported by Finnish volunteers. This territory was crucial for the Soviets, as the Murmansk Petrograd Railway was in the region and they moved overwhelming forces to Karelia to secure it. Dis yeah, and obviously they can't read. Well, obviously they can't re just redo a whole railroad like that, especially their railroad, their railway, because I'm pretty sure they had a huge, big, huge railway system system because of how you know um, rural a lot of their lands and stuff were. But just looking at this map, obviously you can see all those rivers and lakes and stuff like that. It's just too much to have to relocate and you know try to find some land in that forces to Karelia to secure it. Despite some early success, this uprising was crushed in early 1922. In the same year, the Russian Civil War was concluded, and the victorious Union of Soviet Socialist Republics became too strong for Finland to continue these expeditions. Over the next decade, Finland put its faith in the League of Nations, and then its declared neutrality. Simultaneously, Finland enacted a mandatory military training program, and by 1939, 
more than 180,000. So I was about to say, Finland should be like one of those states that Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and freaking uh, Belarus should all be states that should have like mandatory, you know, action or whatever, whatever you want to say, conscription. Because, I mean, they know if you're any of these countries, you should know by now, like, Russia's probably going to come for you. So you should be training everybody that you can. That way you have as many able bodies as you can. And by 1939, more than 180,000 soldiers and officers took part in it. Finland also started building a defensive line from the Gulf of Finland to Lake Ladoga, predicting that the region of the Karelian Isthmus would be the central area of attack of the Soviet forces in a possible war. This chain of fortifications, called the Mannerheim Line after the leader of the Finnish troops, was 150 kilometers long and was built between 1920 to 1924 and 1932 to 1939. It integrated various smaller lakes and swamps along its frontier. Stalin, who became the Soviet leader at the end of the 20s... You know what? Um, I feel like feeling that you got, kind of got lucky with those uh, tiny like little slivers of land that you know Russia has to go send these massive troops to, because it kind of makes it a funneling effect, where it's almost like you know, a Thermopylae effect, where it's just, you know, it doesn't matter how many people you throw at them, it's, everybody's going to essentially be the same at that little point, so it kind of helped them out, looks like, a little bit. But. Who became the Soviet leader at the end of the 20s, considered Finland to be a threat. He wasn't sure that the Finns wouldn't support Germany and allow its troops to attack the USSR through Finland. At the same time, the proximity of the Finnish borders to St. Petersburg, then called Leningrad, and to the Murmansk-Leningrad Railway, was making the Treaty of Tartu tenuous at best. According to the sources, the Soviet Red Army started building railway tracks towards the Finnish border sometime in 1935, planning to use them in a possible invasion. In 1938 and 1939, Soviet diplomats approached the Finns, asking for a new treaty with guarantees that in case of a German invasion, Finland would fight against it and even allow the Soviets to enter the country and join its defense. Stalin was still reorganizing his army after the Great Purge of 1936 to 1938, so he started to look for allies, but was firmly rejected by France and the United Kingdom. As a result, Stalin turned to Hitler and signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with Germany. Officially, this was a non-aggression pact, but its secret clauses divided Eastern Europe into spheres of influence, with the USSR getting Finland, Estonia, Latvia and Eastern Poland. Worried, the Finns attempted to create a Scandinavian alliance, hopeful that a sizable Swedish army would serve as a deterrent. However, this hope was crushed when Sweden caved in to the German and Soviet demands. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland in my opinion, though, this is just my opinion. World War II had already been started with two of its main, uh, two big characters in it already going at war with China and Japan out east. But, you know, obviously we're Westerners over here, but still, you know, I, as a world history buff or whatever you want to call it, I definitely say that it was been started back in the 30s. But And started World War II. In response, the British and French declared war on Hitler. In mid-September, the Soviets invaded Poland from the east. Soon Poland was occupied entirely, despite staunch resistance, its territory divided between the Nazis and the USSR. Stalin immediately demanded that the Baltic countries grant his forces military access, and the latter agreed, allowing almost 80,000 Soviet troops to set up bases. In response, Finland intensified the building of the Mannerheim Line, adding 150 concrete bunkers in short order. On the 5th of October 1939, Stalin summoned a Finnish delegation to Moscow. The Soviets demanded the border along the Karelian Isthmus be moved to the northwest, away from Leningrad. They also demanded the islands in the Gulf of Finland and the Kalasta Yansarento Peninsula, the establishment of a Soviet military base on the Hanko Peninsula, and the obviously that's not going to happen like that's literally just inviting them to 
essentially take back over their, that either take back over that land or set them up as a puppet state and you know what I'm saying like no good good self-respecting country is going to do that you know soviet military base on the hanko peninsula and the destruction of all fortifications on the karelian isthmus in return finland would have received repola and poyayabi simultaneously both sides started mobilizing their forces under the guise of training and the Finns began evacuating civilians from the Karelian Isthmus and the cities along the Baltic coast. Even though Hermann Goering approached the Finnish government and asked them to agree to these demands, the Finns attempted to negotiate, giving their counteroffer and receiving another Soviet demand, which they responded to with another counteroffer. On the 13th of November, the negotiations broke down. On the 26th of November, a Soviet border post was attacked in an incident later known as the shelling of Manila. The Soviets immediately claimed that it was a Finnish attack and demanded they move their forces away from the border. Finland denied this and called for an independent commission to investigate the event. Modern sources have confirmed that it was a false flag operation. Pretty much exactly, it sounds like exactly like they were trying to do with uh, essentially what Japan tried to, or did with um... China and going forth uh, from the uh, Manchuria province and all that stuff with the, um, you know what I'm saying, blowing up the train and all that. ...have confirmed that it was a false flag operation conducted by the USSR to implicate the Finns. On the 29th of November, the Soviets broke diplomatic relations with Finland and one day later renounced the non-aggression pact between their two countries. The Winter War had begun. The leader of the Soviet army in the region was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, commander of the Leningrad military district, Meretskov, who had four well-equipped armies at his disposal. The 7th Army under Yakovlev had nine infantry divisions, plus one tank and four armoured brigades. It was tasked with taking over the Karelian Isthmus and the city of Vipuri, and then pushing to the Finnish capital, Helsinki. Although the Soviets knew about the Mannerheim Line, they lacked details and the 7th Army was expected to achieve its goals in three weeks, which was extremely optimistic, even considering that the Ladogan and Baltic fleets were going to assist. The 8th Army under Kabarov consisted of five infantry divisions and one light-armoured brigade, and it was entrusted with a breakthrough to the north of Lake Ladoga. The army would then either drive deep or attack the Finnish defenders of the Karelian Isthmus from the rear. Commanded by Duhanov, the 9th Army had four divisions and an objective to take Kiyani and then Olu, thus cutting Finland in two. In the far north, Frolov's 14th Army consisted of two infantry divisions and one mountain division. Frolov, supported by the Soviet Northern Fleet, was ordered to seize Petsamo, as that would have prevented a possible intervention via Norway or the Barents Sea, and then swing south towards Rovaniemi. In total, the Soviet army had 425,000. Yeah, obviously we see how this is definitely a uh, David, and, David and Goliath story, because it seems like they had the perfect plan, but um, obviously this they there's just something that they were missing and the fact that they were we can already see that they were missing just simple little things as to like how many bunkers there are on this you know huge line and stuff like that when obviously it feels like you know just a simple uh fly around you know the the area would do which you know i'm sure i'm sure finland wouldn't have you know shot at the plane or something but maybe they would have you never know but i feel like you know saying that would have sort uh you know have been pretty good to see you know those type of fortifications and soldiers 3000 artillery pieces 2300 tanks and 2500 planes in comparison to the 24 soviet divisions finland had just 14 and even those were 20 percent smaller in terms of military personnel for a total of 265,000 soldiers the army of the isthmus was commanded by ershterman and consisted of six divisions, with the 3rd Army Corps on his left flank and the 2nd Army Corps on the right. The 4th Army Corps under Heiskanen was located to the north of Laduga and had two divisions, while the North Finland group, led by Tuompo, was made up of the border guards, reservists and former members of the White Guard. 
The Finns also had just 500 artillery pieces, 26 tanks and 270 planes, which meant that the Soviets had an overwhelming advantage in aerial combat and in open terrain. At the same time, the Finns had a shortage of artillery ammunition and even small arms, which meant that they had no hope to win open battles. However, most of the territory that would be initially attacked by the Soviets was impassable for tanks, so they needed a breakthrough to get into the area more suitable for their armour. The Finnish forces were mostly concentrated on the Karelian Isthmus and to the north of Ladoga, with smaller groups in north and central Finland. Those less populated areas were convenient for large-scale guerrilla combat, but on the Isthmus and around Ladoga, the Finns would be forced to fight the Soviets head-on. Despite being heavily propagandized, the Mannerheim line was hardly impassable, as the Finns didn't have enough artillery and bunkers, with its weakest point being near Summa. The line's strongest points were on the Gulf of Finland and Lake Ladoga, as the defenders managed to create effective artillery systems on the nearby islands. Mannerheim expected his army to contain the Soviets for up to six months, after which, he hoped, Finland would be supported by France and the UK. The war started on the morning of the 30th of November with Soviet artillery volleys against the Finnish lines and bombing runs against the nearby cities, leading to civilian casualties. On the Isthmus, the Finnish border was mostly defended by the reservists and border guard belonging to the 11th Division. Although heavily outnumbered, this group was able to hold the Soviet advance for seven days before they retreated behind the Mannerheim line. This stalwart defence gave enough time for other Finnish divisions to take their positions along the line. As the Finns had a more significant concentration of forces on the right flank, the Soviets decided to delay their plan. Which, if anything, just plays right into Finland's plan anyway, because if they would have brushed it onto the left, they probably would have been able to do something, maybe even encircle them, since they said the, the left side wasn't as fortified, but they're trying to focus all their power on the most fortified part of it. No wonder it was such a huge bloodbath. As the Finns had a more significant concentration of forces on the right flank, the Soviets decided to delay their plans to attack towards Vipuri and continue the advance on their right. Crossing the Voxi River seemed like a great way to split the enemy front, but the Taipale River was a more comfortable crossing, so the Soviet 150th and 49th Divisions were tasked with attacking there. However, this lag allowed the Finnish 10th Division defending there to concentrate more artillery in the area and start shelling the Soviets, leading to severe casualties. The Soviet artillery countervolleyed and their troops began the crossing. Although the Finnish batteries managed to inflict even more damage on the Soviets coming across, and there were counterattacks, by the 12th the Red Army had gained a foothold on the Kokoniemi Peninsula. Here they started waiting for the 49th Armoured Brigade to arrive. At the same time hoping to gain multiple footholds, the Soviets launched an attack on the town of Kivinyemi. As the commander of the 7th Army, Yakovlev, was pressured to make progress as quickly as possible, they attacked as soon as engineer battalions arrived, with no reconnaissance or artillery support. Hundreds of Red Army soldiers died in this failed attack on the night of the 7th of December. Despite that, Yakovlev informed his superiors that he had a foothold and ordered his troops to attack again. His soldiers refused to carry out the order in an unprecedented fashion. On the 8th, Yakovlev was relieved of his duties and replaced by Meritskov himself. Soviet headquarters ordered more troops to join the 7th Army. Meritskov decided that he needed to attack simultaneously along Lake Ladoga and towards Vipuri to put more pressure on the defenders, but that caused even more chaos, as the Soviets started moving artillery and armor towards the Gulf of Finland and the two small roads in the area. Yeah, so if anything, uh, we can see that how um, you know Russia's poor infrastructure around this time was a, kind of a double-edged sword for them, because obviously it helped stop the, uh, the Germans and stuff like that, but it also kind of uh, mugs them up too, so... And, yeah. Finland and the two small roads in the area weren't nearly enough. 
This delay was used by the Finns to reinforce and camouflage their positions. So, when the Soviet right flank troops started barraging the enemy, they barely did any damage. On the other hand, Finnish artillery was able to inflict heavy casualties on the Red Army soldiers attacking around the Kokunyemi Peninsula. After each volley, the Finns would move their cannons to a new position, making it impossible for the Soviets to pinpoint their batteries. The Soviets' attempts to make their foothold larger continued until the 25th, but were stopped, losing thousands of troops and almost all of their tanks. However, to the west, Stalin's units managed to gain another foothold by taking Krelia. The Finns were able to bring more troops to the area and started shelling the Soviet foothold. This prevented the Soviets from gaining even more territory to the north of the river, and by the 28th, the remaining Soviet troops were forced yeah, to... These fools freaking uh, attacked one of the most supportive... Like, look at... I just, I just I want to understand like their their thought process because it's like why attack the most fortified piece of the line when they had when they said it themselves you know what I'm saying the whole um, east or western northern part of it is essentially weaker because they didn't have as much artillery or bunkers on that side so it's like you know what I'm saying why not go you know heavy on that side but maybe the train didn't allow for it maybe. Obviously, we can see uh, the uh, the roads didn't allow for that great a movement up there, but still, you know, I don't know. But let's keep going. Treat. Thus ended the Battle of Taipale. The Soviets lost more than 10,000 soldiers, while the Finnish casualties were around 2,000. However, this was just the beginning of the Winter War, and we're planning to talk more about it down the line. Our second channel, The Cold. Alright guys, we'll go ahead and end it right. Yeah guys, thank you again for joining me on another episode of Mike's Intellectual Corner. I'm definitely excited to get into this um, new series. But uh, if you guys like it, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you guys when I see you. I'm out.